Welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast, brought to you by Milo Tree. Here's your host, Jillian Leslie. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Blogger Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Jillian Leslie. I am a serial entrepreneur, and I love helping other entrepreneurs, bloggers, creators grow their businesses. Before I get started today, I wanted to give you an update on Milo Tree Cart. This is the payment solution, David, my husband and I have created for you to sell digital products to your audience with ease. With my Lotri Cart, you can sell memberships and workshops and coaching, and we've just rolled out the ability for you to sell digital downloads of any size, of any file type, and we will deliver them directly to your customers. So to check this out, go to mylotreecart.com and just play around. Also, what I am discovering is it is a perfect platform for you creators who have audiences who do not like learning new tech platforms, but who want to get started selling. I am watching bloggers with audiences tap into new income streams of thousands of dollars. It is so exciting. If you are one of these people, you're a blogger or creator, you have an audience, a significant audience, but you are not selling anything to them, please get on a call with me. Head to mylotree.com slash meet and we'll set up a call because there is money waiting for you. For today's episode, I have Steve Weidman on the show. He is an SEO, a search engine optimizer. This episode is all about real strategies you can implement now to get more site visitors. Things like how to handle a Google algorithm update, how often to be updating your posts, how to drive more backlinks. Those are links from other sites to your site. So Google sees your content matters. You want practical advice, Steve is delivering. If you're trying to grow your traffic, definitely listen to this episode. So without further delay, here is my interview with Steve Weideman. Steve, welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you are an SEO, you have an agency, and you are a college professor. And a a textbook author, apparently. And last year I got pulled into that too. So now I've got more titles than I know what to do with. (laughs) Okay. So will you share though, how you got into kind of digital marketing, SEO, all of that? Of course. You know, I I was always kind of a computer nerd. Even as a kid, I played um, Oregon Trail on the Apple IIe and I always had an interest in computing. And so while I was in the service, this whole internet thing came about in the early 90s. And um, I started to be a hobbyist for friends, building them websites for their um, side businesses, their DJ businesses, their, um, you know, wedding coordination businesses, whatever. And and I, they had these beautiful brochure sites with the scrolling marquees and the, you know, bevel and emboss buttons, too much drop shadow, all that old stuff we used to do. And they'd say, hey, Steve, I, I love my site. It's so cool. I've got all my pictures on here and everything, but it's not really making me money. And, um, you know, I can't keep paying you to do website work for me if it's not really doing anything. Um, and, you know, the whole idea of internet marketing was still kind of a new idea, right? We were, we were building websites to put on our business cards in the late 90s. And so I had to, I had to figure out by necessity, hey, if I'm going to keep this extra little side income coming in and help my friends who really want to get more DJ gigs and whatever, um, you know, to do a good job, I've got to figure out how to get people to come to their website. I was working at, at IBM was our, our day job where my friend, the, the DJ came in one day mad. He was angry. I'm like, I'm like, what happened? Did, you, did your site break or something? What's going on? He's like, turn it off. Like, what do you mean turn off? Turn it off. I'm one guy. I can't take all these calls. This is ridiculous. Like, hold hold on. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm booked until July. Um, you got to take this down because I, I'm one guy. I cannot hold on a second. Um, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm booked until August. And so, so it was that very moment that I realized, oh my God, there's something in this. Here we are today with 13 employees and get to work with some really exciting multi-location and franchise brands, um, working with one sort of famous uh, person in the, the home um, and cooking space, which is really exciting. And, uh, and every day we're learning, and this is, you know, this right in, in our industry and in digital, 
every day we're learning. And even if we don't want to, Google's going to turn around tomorrow, change exactly. their algorithm. And guess what you get to do tomorrow? You get to learn. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about that because here's the thing. It's all like you are learning, right? And you're seeing everything evolve, but it's not like Google opens their book and goes, Hey, here's how it all works. Mm -hmm. So it's like a lot of kind of experiments, guesswork, talking to other people to figure out how things are evolving. So I want Math, to talk about science, art and creativity. Exactly. Yep. So I want to talk about how you know what you how do people like you know that this is really what how things work and about this new Google update and what that means for everybody. Sure. Yeah. And they're, they're going to be doing updates. Uh, they used to do it every four months or so. Um, they did a lot last year, more than usual. Um, but I think the perspective to have around Google updates is if you're, if you're following SEO principles and focusing on trying to have the most helpful, relevant page, trying to promote that page off your website as much as you can, um, trying to make sure that other other websites are talking about your name in correlation to the words that tie into those pages. Um, and you're working to make sure that your search appearance stands out from the competition. If you've got a recipe and you're not using the right recipe markup, uh, the recipe is like a going to outrank you because you right. just don't stand out. So, right. so if you're focusing on those three areas every month, improving the quality of my page and the conversion rates and the bounce rates, improving, um, you know, how visible my page is off the website through doing relationship building and outreach and influencer marketing um, and improving the click through rate of my search results every month. If, if you don't have that mindset, um, then you have to worry a little bit about, about algorithm updates. But if you do, you won't because every month you're going to be showing the search engines a pattern of improvement across your content, your visibility, and your search experience uh, and the user behavior signals that come with it. And you don't have to worry about algorithm updates. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when they do happen and you do get a bit of a hit, most of the time it's just a short-term shuffling. Just let it ride and mm -hmm. watch what happens in a couple of weeks as the spammy results that came to the top start to go down. When mm. users start to recognize that wasn't very helpful, then they go to that you know ninth or tenth listing that you got moved down to. They click on you, and over time, you just do that flip, and you come right back. Uh, we had a client recently that was slightly impacted on May 25th when the algorithm update hit. We said, just relax. It's it's just doing its little shuffle to see if these new results are helpful. You'll know in a couple of weeks. Um, I kid you not. A couple of weeks later, everything's right back to normal, and now every day we're seeing a little bit of growth. Do you so think I would that say not to worry about it. the Google algorithm is like a meritocracy <laughs> or do you think that you can game it? And I don't think you need to, I don't think you need to game it. Like I said, if, if you're sitting down once a month and looking at, at the metrics that correspond to those three areas, okay, you're never so going to have to worry about it. Let's go through these again. So okay. I sit down it's the beginning of the month. What am I looking at? The, the first thing you're going to, you're going to pay attention to is um, the performance of your content, right? So, is my content so like, still performing? So like, are my best blog posts still, let's say on the first page of Google? Um, no, is no, my I wouldn't overall even worry traffic... about the first page of Google. I would worry about whether the the organic traffic is is garnering more engagement to those pages. If I, if I lose 5,000 visits on a page, but my conversion rate goes up and the number of conversions I'm getting on that page is improved or the same, that's fine. And it's what's probably happened is Google saw that the keywords they were displaying me for weren't very helpful to the, and my page wasn't very helpful to those keywords. So that's a normal thing to see organic traffic drop as Google figures out what you're relevant to and what you're not. Mm -hmm. So most of the time you're, you're fine with traffic going down a little bit, as long as the conversions and the, and the engagements that are happening in that content aren't changing. Okay. So the first so thing I would then, look at, I, try, I would look at the engagement for now, sure. Now, what about though? A lot of people who are listening to this are bloggers and they care about page views and sessions. Sure. So that so, becomes the currency that they're looking at. So then, then you what you want to do is take that URL, uh, the URLs that that you lost traffic on, go into Google Search Console, mm -hmm. that free tool that Google gives us to look at. And our by page. the way, if, if, if people have not installed. Google search console, please pause this episode, now. go Google how to do it. It's not hard <laughs> and go install it. 
where's that video clip of Arnold being like, do it now, do it, <laughs> you know, do the thing, install storage console. Yeah. Um, yes. So yeah, you, for sure, you've got to get out there and, and get that set up if you're not and put that URL in there and then compare from before and after the algorithm update uh, by doing a sort by uh, impressions and by clicks, what went down, what went up. Sometimes what you'll find is what went down actually moved to another similar page that you created. Mm -hmm. Maybe you mm -hmm. created something new for the season and your old 2021 top 10 birthday gift ideas or something lost traffic because the new 2022 page absorbed it. A lot of times that's what you'll find in some of that data, but sometimes you'll find it being just the opposite. Maybe, maybe the page was driving a lot of traffic for top 10 ways to do X, how to, where to, why to, whatever, whatever you created your content from by looking at answer the public or Uber suggests to, to drive it. And suddenly you've, you've lost traction on it. Um, what I would do there is, is go to the actual search results, see who's appearing. And then what you do is a side by side, take a, a Google sheet, put your URL in there and, and put the top 10 pages in there and start to, to pinpoint attributes. Then take a, a couple rows and start to start to document the, the topics and subtopics that those other pages are mentioning. Maybe, maybe if you have a, a post on how to clean white shoes and most of the top pages include things like uh, bleach and toothpaste and um, and something else, and you're missing those from your page, and Google thinks that those pages answer the problem better based on how users interact with it, well, then now it's time to go and update your page based on what you've learned and what the competition's doing, and then just do it better. Make it make better diagrams, make the, make the video uh, that the competitors don't have on their pages. Um, you know, and and the other thing I would do too, uh, this part one is, you know, content, compare your content to theirs. Uh, what could you do to make yours better? And what are the topics that are being used? The, the second part of that is looking at where the top 10 pages are getting their links. So use a tool like ahrefs.com or semrush.com or, or plenty of online link uh, analysis tools that you could use. Figure out where those other websites are getting links and reach out to those sites and say, hey, I, I see that you're you're mentioning this article that so-and-so did, which I think is amazing, but wait till you see ours. <laughs> Take a look at what we did. And by the way, if you'd like us to create some supplemental content based on, on our article for your website, um, we're happy to donate graphics, video, whatever you want so that you can get some traffic from this as well. All we ask in exchange is that you give us attribution. AKA Do you think that works? Because I get those it's emails worked. all the time. Oh, yeah. It depends on how and you're it's communicating like, for sure. What'd yeah. you say? It depends on how you're communicating. If you're, if you get the link request email, yeah, I, I don't even read them. I just delete them. Right. Um, this is, this is more about the the relationship piece of it. And that's getting on social with someone that, that, you know, is um, the editor running the site and, and actually communicating with them in a, in a DM, not in an email. Um, mm -hmm. The emails, they just don't work anymore. They're dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. You've, well, you've got to connect with them directly. Yeah. I did do, I did uh, something which I hadn't done previously. I Googled like, top blogging podcasts. And I realized that I wasn't in a couple of them and uh -huh. I reached out and just introduced myself like personal email, not long, but not like a uh, canned email. Yeah. And I said, Hey, I see, you know, this is a great list and I love a lot of the shows on it. And would you take a look at my show to right. include it? And I've gotten two people, two sites to add yeah. my podcast. That's amazing. You know, sometimes when you when you give in your email as opposed to ask, that 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 will work still. I, I love doing that where I I reach out and I volunteer something, um, volunteer my time, volunteer. Hey, I, I recently wrote an article that's already on the first page of Google for this other platform, and I'm looking for more places I could I could contribute content. Um, looks like they're they're doing pretty good with that. If if there's something that I can do for you. Um, you know, fantastic. And then you build that relationship. And then six months down the road, you go back and six months will fly by. You go back and you're like, hey, you know, I've, I've given you guys a lot of content and some really cool things. And I, I, I did this thing a few months ago and I, I totally forgot to ask, would it, would it be okay if maybe you mentioned this thing in this research that we did that, um, that can support this other page that you wrote? Um, like, wait a minute, you've, you've contributed so much to our own traffic and our own content. And um, the least we could do is, is give you a shout out and, and link to that. And, and that page is awesome. In fact, we'll, we'll share it on social media for you too. Mm. So it starts with the relationship, I think more than anything else. Uh, but uh, the approach of do something for me, as opposed to, Hey, I'd like to do something for you. 
It's, mm-hmm. it's a completely different paradigm and I seem to have better results from it. I had a, I had a, a team member several years ago say, Steve, I, I, there's no way in hell that I can get a college website to link to our site. There's just no way. Um, you know, I've been doing link building now for three years, um, doing outreach calls, emails, everything I can do. And I, I cannot get an EDU link. And I said, you can, you just have to think about the angle. Um, and figure out a way that you can provide some value. So what I did is I I recorded my screen. I I opened up my email and uh, I found some local colleges. North uh, Northridge was one of them. Professor Mike Lloyd, digital marketing instructor at um, uh, you know at, at Northridge. So I'm like, oh, and here's his email address. So I, hey Mike, um, you know I'm Steve Weedham and I'm actually right down the street from from Northridge. Well, about an hour away. And um, I've been doing some guest speaking at, at other colleges. And I was wondering if you want me to perhaps come in and, and talk a little bit about search marketing strategy and some things that we're doing with brands like Skechers and some other fun things, if you think your students would uh, would appreciate it. Um, I'm just trying to give back to the, the community a bit and to the future SEOs. Let me know if you're interested. Within like 10 minutes, you know, I paused my little Camtasia. Within like 10 minutes, I got an email, unpaused Camtasia. <laughs> Mike's like, Steve, yeah, I'd love that. Are you available on June 6th? Yeah. Absolutely. Let's, let's make this thing happen. Um, you know, and then I shot the video back over to the, the link builder. And I'm like, there you go. Less than 20 minutes. I was able to get a commitment that would be the catalyst to us earning a link from a college. Wow. Wow. What I love about what you're saying, because you're an SEO. So you're in there looking at the data, you know, kind of nerding out on that. And at the end of the day, you're telling me it's one-on-one relationship building. Absolutely. hundred percent. And, and I think, I think the search engines are looking for that too, right? If other websites are, are curating your answers, like what, um, what is the best way to do X? The best way to do X is to do such and such, such and such. And everybody who hits that page goes, wow, this is really great. And they copy that short answer pretty soon. Google starts to think that's the best answer and you get the featured snippet. And that's, that's a relationship in and of itself because you're giving the answer first and not making the reader scroll the whole darn article to get the one thing that they needed that you could have summed up in the first paragraph. So you get that first summary in there and it's really important to do that. I know you want them to stay on your page, but because they're going to curate that and other folks who are writing their own articles are going to quote that paragraph. They're going to share it. Uh, they're going to put it on Quora and, and uh, Yahoo Answers. And eventually Google is going to realize, hey, that's the best answer to this thing. Not only am I going to rank you well, I'm going to give you the featured snippet position zero, which, by the way, shows up on 70 percent of voice searches. When you ask your assistant a question, it's going to pull that featured snippet first 70 percent of the time. I wanted to take a quick break because whenever I do SEO podcast episodes, I always say if you are not using my blog post checklist, definitely grab it. If you go to mylotree.com slash blog post checklist, you will get a worksheet that you can use so you don't forget anything when it comes to optimizing your posts. I get so much good feedback on this. Again, mylotree.com slash blog post checklist. And now back to the show. I want to break this down. Let's do so it. So I'm a blogger and I'm, I'm blogging about how to whiten your sneakers. And you're saying when I, and let's say, you know, based on you were talking about bleach and toothpaste, toothpaste and I'll, I'll throw whatever. vinegar in there. Right? Let's do it. So we got three possibilities. And you're saying when I start this blog post, I start it with like very important information so that Google sees that and other people are seeing that. So I'm not burying in the middle, wanting people to scroll down my page so they see the ads on my on my site, but I'm willing to give it away at the beginning. Correct. And and it's like, how am I structuring that? Am I putting a big, you know, my, my, uh, my title, and then I'm doing some H2s. Like what are, walk me through how you would create this piece of content. Do you remember, um, do you remember in college and and even I think a little bit in high school, we used to use the modern language association guidelines when we wrote our thesis statements, we had a a cover page, we had a, a main heading. Yes. We had we had a Three thesis supporting paragraph group, and right? they write the paragraphs. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we had a thesis and then we had subheadings to support it. Uh, we, we said what we were going to say, we said it. And then we said what we said. We just right? said, we yeah. what we said. So I, I think if we structure our pages in the same manner um, 
and we we make sure our headings are in sequence, right? Your main heading one, heading two. Don't start with heading two and then go to heading one. Keep those headings in sequence. It makes it makes it really easy for users and search engines to to understand how that page is structured. It to understand topics and subtopics because we're using H1, H2, H3 in, in our headings um, in the right order. We're summarizing the page in the short summary at the top. And you can even call that if you want. You could just say short summary, right? Or or the short answer, uh, read below to get the details on how to clean with bleach, how to clean with vinegar, right? Uh, but you start with that first paragraph under 375 characters or a really short bullet list that might actually become your table of contents. Mm -hmm. So you could say, here's the, the 10 steps to doing X and you put it right at the top and that's a, a little box around it with a table of contents. Um, then, you know, you've, of course, then you get the checklist right in that featured snippet as well. And if you want to go the next level with it, you could put a little copy to clipboard uh, button right next to your paragraph, almost mm -hmm. like that amazing tool that you have for Pinterest that I love. Mm -hmm. um, so you have something similar that's a copy to clipboard where it only copies the short answer or the, the, the checklist items itself, short answers, right? Not long paragraph um, uh, list, but really short answers. And, and you'll see after time, people are going to copy that put it on their own websites, and eventually you'll have that featured answer. So I, I would say start with that main strong headline to convince them that what they were searching for is going to be available on this page. If you can get a keyword in there, great. But remember, don't obsess over keywords. Solve for the user's intent first, the keyword second. Um, then we're going to have our, um, our short paragraph, our short summary. Here's what you're going to find on this page. Here's a short answer. Um, then you have the table of contents. So it, it drops to different sections of the of the page. So maybe wait, so I my, don't want to know the intro. intro paragraph, then uh -huh. my table of contents with my solution. You got it. And with then my make 10 sure you, steps. you have those. And yep, then each one contents. is going to connect, is going to link to that part of the solution with another Correct. heading. You got it. subheading. Yep. Subheading. Subheading. Uh -huh. So your subheading will be an H2 for using. Uh, vinegar to clean your shoes. And then another subheading will be using, um, you know, bleach to clean your shoes. And then each one of those have an image and that image is going to be, um, you know, how dash to dash use dash vinegar uh, dash to clean shoes dot JPEG, right? So it's really clear what that image is so that Google can interpret the URL. So it's not just IMG 00153.jpg. Yeah. Um, use an alt tag to describe the image. Use a caption. To describe the image if you want to get really nerdy you can use this structured markup schema.org forward slash image object so that when somebody does see your your post on a, a mobile device that'll have a beautiful little thumbnail next to it and make it more clickable um so uh, and then video do the exact same thing with video mark up your video with video object uh, make sure the video thumbnail is named after you know the the keyword that you want that page uh, to appear for um, and then, you know, include it in your video XML sitemap that you feed to Google Search Console. So now okay, you've, so wait, you've I wanna, got- I wanna pause you here. Do I need to know all of what you were just saying? Do I need scheme, Do nope. I need to mark up my content for it to, for, to give me that competitive advantage? It's helpful, but it's not required. Do you these, think these I are could all still things rank that, that give though? you a little bit you, of an edge. Do you think I should be watching YouTube videos on marking up all of the elements on my page? I and what this means, helpful. by the way- just as a pause to everybody, it's like you're giving Google information about what this content is. This is a video. This is a heading. This is a whatever. So that Google goes, oh, I don't have to guess at what this is. They're telling me what it is. And that's the what, but the why and the hidden agenda for us SEOs is so that we have rich results in search and that we get clicked on more often. That way, Google thinks our listing is more helpful because we're getting clicked on more often. And all these these schema things that we do, you, you don't have to know any coding. I don't know any of them. I've been doing this for, what, 25 years? And I know the the type, like the image object and whatever, but I, I couldn't for the life of me do it by hand. So I, I use plugins that make say, it really easy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you use yeah. plugins. Or generators. Just do a search for schema generator. And okay. there's there's thousands of them out there. And okay. just plug, plug, plug what it is that you want to mark up into the tool and it spits out all the code for you and you just copy and paste it. Okay, so, good. All right. So easy. I think that if, you know, to get that edge, because I feel like everything is about these tiny edges. 
<laughs> like getting this little advantage and then a little advantage, you know, there isn't this like silver bullet. No, I, I look at it like Miss Pac-Man. I got a ton of arcade games here, and Miss Pac-Man's one of my favorites. Um, I feel like I feel like there's there's these pellets that you're you're um you're eating as you're going through and improving your your page all the time. Like, what else can I do? What else can I improve? And and for each thing that you do, you get extra points to those pellets. And there are power pellets, right? Like page experience is a huge power pellet. Um uh, having a strong conversion focal point, like a sticky footer that has the the call to action and that's always omnipresent is to me as a power palette um getting links to Wait, that could you page explain that site. why so like let's say it's to like join my email list or what what do you well yeah it depends on it depends on the 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 intent of the user when they hit the page i like my my upper funnel content to to try to get them to join an email list or an opt-in or um, to download something, get a free list, sign up for a free course, get my masterclass. Um, if it's a sales page, so my call to actions are generally something like contact us or or chat with us now, send me a text message, right? Anything that I can do to get the fastest engagement with them um, that that leads on to a sale, I'm going to do on those lower funnel pages. But And where are you uh, on putting the upper... this on your post? These so, call to so yeah, the sticky, the sticky buttons uh, are great in the footer because the user doesn't have to find them. They know throughout the time that they're reading it, what, what they're expected to do as a next step, if they, if they want to engage in the page. So I think, and, and we've seen it where, especially on lower funnel pages where we've added, I remember one of the restaurant chains that we work with um, during the pandemic, they had driving directions as the sticky footer link. And I'm like, Hey, how about now that there's a pandemic going on, we put start order in there mm. maybe right by our thumb right we'll start order we get an email monday morning and it was it was guys we had a two million dollar weekend what happened what was going on can someone look at the analytics and like we put a button for start order and it was omnipresent for the user they didn't have to try to think about or have any friction in getting to the place where they placed an order we did the same thing with an attorney we uh we made his sticky buttons chat or call Right. The call was closest to the thumb and the chat was a little bit further and 300 percent improvement in click through rate. So mm. overnight. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. OK, that makes a, again, it makes sense. Like when you just kind of go, well, if you think about people and that they are looking for easy solutions and if you can mm -hmm. offer up that easy solution, it's amazing that people will take action. And stop looking at your desktop sites. Look oh my at your God, mobile. yes. 80% of your traffic's on mobile. Stop looking at desktop. Look at your mobile. You know? that, is a, that is always a reminder <laughs> I need to hear because my husband right. and I, we sit here at these big computers, you know, uh -huh. and it, you're abs because we, this is how we work, but you're yeah. absolutely, absolutely right about that. Okay, so Except here's a question. Difference. So you're talking about like update your content and is there a point at which it's you can update it too much? Um, like, should you not be in there futzing around all the time? Also, this is always this uh, kind of, I, I get asked this question all the time. How long should my blog post be? Is there some rule about that? And how would you answer both of those questions? Those are actually really, really, really easy questions. Um, I wouldn't touch many of my content right after an algorithm update. I like to let it, I like to let the dust settle. So I don't touch any content until at least two or three weeks after a major algorithm update. Just to best practice, because if they're still making their updates in the middle of you updating a page, it could it could impact the history of that URL. So mm -hmm. for me, I just kind of let, let that settle wherever I can. It doesn't mean you can't create new content. I just wouldn't touch my most important pages during that period, mm -hmm. um, at least a few weeks after. So um, is there ever um, where you're doing too much? I don't think so. If if the things that you're doing are are conducive to improving your conversion rates and bounce rates, one thing that you could do to to mitigate that a bit is you could create a paid search page or a landing page that's not indexed by search engines, perhaps on a subdomain, right? Maybe a, a staging environment um, that you can create, and then send some uh, divide your traffic up. Use like Google Optimize and divide your traffic up between the current page and the test page to see which one performs better. And if the one that 
um, performs better on the staging environment, um, then roll that out as a, as a live page. So do some tests like that first, divide the traffic up, keep one of the pages not indexed. So Google knows exactly, you know, which one is the, the canonical that should appear in the search results and which one is the, the testing environment. I think that's and then a you're safe sending way. Paid, you're sending paid traffic to the other, like explain. You could, yeah. You could send paid traffic or send uh, email. You can do a split email test. I'm going to send out a, a thousand emails, 500 to this version, 500 to this version. And let's see which one performs better. Um, there's all sorts of mediums that you could use so from ads to email to social posts, paid social, right? You can do all sorts of different ways to drive traffic to those pages to run that test. You could mm -hmm. also use a crowdsourcing site like Mechanical Turk mm -hmm. and, and AB and say, which page do you like better, the A or B and why? Make sure they say why, otherwise they sometimes skip the task, don't even read it. And they're just like, give me my 15 cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, uh, it's it's a really good tool to use to um, uh, to get real user feedback. And if you want to pay money, you could use like usertesting.com. Mm -hmm. That gets really expensive mm -hmm. and you have to put a lot of documentation together about what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Mechanical Turk, you can just put out a really quick, which version do you like and why? Okay, so and and let's so Mechanical Turk is like Amazon, right? It's where you Amazon can hire Mechanical. people to do tasks really inexpensive. For five cents, five cents. Okay, a task. so what you're saying, and by the way, like A B testing, I have a love hate relationship <laughs> to it because it sounds like really statistical, but yet it's, I think, very difficult to get re hmm. like honest, real results because. It's hard to get your numbers high enough, you know, in terms of um, like your N equals whatever, you know, like Coke could do okay. a very good A-B test because they have so yeah. much traffic. But if you're talking about small traffic, it's really hard to get statistically significant results. I'll keep it simple. So here's here's an example. We, um, we asked 2000 users in Mechanical Turk, five cents each, uh, which of three pages they would buy a hot tub from. From this Lowe's page, this Home Depot's page, or this jacuzzi.com page? Um, and then why? Why would they choose? And then we even asked the third question in that one is, um, what's uh, what was it? What's uh, the one thing that really stood out for you, right? And and why you chose this, this particular one versus another? Um, and then we ended up with those 2,000 rows in an Excel sheet that we downloaded. Um, we took a column and we said theme. What's the theme of this one? Oh, they're saying that Jacuzzi site doesn't have price transparency, right? They don't say what the prices are, how much they cost. Um, they like the Lowe's page because, you know, it, it had a really easy way that they could place an order where Jacuzzi was this longer drawn out process. So we, we took all those different themes um, and then we just did a quick pivot table in Excel to see which themes came up the most often. Oh my God, the, the theme that came up the most often, 35% of the people surveyed said that they um, they thought that this page needed price transparency. And now you go to the Jacuzzi site and there's a little dollar signs and they're, they're giving you more than they did back before they had a PDF you could download uh, on price transparency. And that was the result of us doing a very easy, non-mathematical required study uh, by asking 200 people a couple short questions, theming them, and then doing a, a pivot table to um, to do some math on what were the common themes. It's that not, is so interesting. That is mm -hmm. so interesting. <laughs> As we're launching um, Milo Tree Cart, I want to talk uh -huh. to you about how we could do that. That is very interesting. You know, Super we're putting easy. together some yeah. landing pages. And again, we're really close to them and we want to know how, but again, like using something like user testing, I know is very expensive. So oh, and we're gonna, time consuming. Oh my God, the brief you've got to put together. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a brief that you have to use and use user testing. It, it's, it's almost like it was made for people whose jobs are user testing. Mm. It, it really makes me not want to use them. Mm. But, um, but whereas when you just do a quick little mm -hmm. survey, you know, and, and you can just drop like, a, um, what's the. What's the survey tool? I want Survey Monkey. You just mm -hmm. use like a Survey Monkey and drop the URL right in a Mechanical Turk and say, "Okay, go." Right. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, interesting. Okay, yeah. so so to wrap this up, talk to me just briefly about patience. Okay. And when I'm playing, when I'm doing SEO, it's the long game. It is. And how would you? How do you kind of? speak to people who want immediate results? Like how long yeah. should they be waiting for sure. their traffic to grow, for things to start working for them? Right. And and I know that 
the the default answer for most SEOs is always it depends. And my my it depends on this one, unfortunately, is is it depends on the competitive nature of the keyword that they're trying to appear for. So if it's a super competitive keyword, like best mortgage rates in California or something versus, um, you know, uh, how to tie your shoes quickly or something, right? Um, depending on on how competitive a certain search term is, is going to determine how long it takes. It took Bob's watches nearly three years to appear for uh, some of the product models that they have. They're all on the first page now, but it was a lot of time, patience, and nurturing to make that happen. I often get asked, how long does it take to rank? And and the the generalized answer I give that that helps get clear the you know the or, or paint a picture, I suppose, of, of how SEO works is, is our content is what is going to get us um, in Google's index and showing up for some of the search terms that we've included on the page itself. They're going to look at those keywords and say, okay, great, I'm going to test this URL for the words that you've used on this page. And that could take up to three months before you see yourself on maybe page two or three. Next, it's going to be around the off-page signals. Are other websites mentioning my brand name, or as Google likes to refer to it, like the entity? Are they using that entity and the words, um, you know, that that I want my page to appear for off the website? And they're like, hey, I, I noticed this entity and I noticed this keyword. What do I have in my database for that site? Oh, I found a URL that best matches that query. So great, now I know which page to show. So if we get other websites to link to us and mention us um, you know, with the search terms we wanna appear for, maybe six months down the road, we'll find ourselves on page one. Hey, we did it. We got through the three months of our content being amazing and getting us to page two. We're on the bottom of page one now, thanks to the links and mentions that we have. Now we need to get to the first position. So let's make sure that our listing stands out among all the other ones. Let's make sure we have our, our rich results and our video thumbnails and our um, star ratings, our recipe markup, whatever it is that we can do. Um, let's use title tag principles instead of just writing keyword dash the name of my site. Let's do a call to action, buy, read, download, order, find out, learn how to. Let's use the keyword we want to rank for. And let's use a unique selling proposition. Why should they choose us? The ultimate guide to. Um, uh, best reference for, um, uh, I don't know, if it's if it's commerce, maybe it's something like free shipping or uh, lowest price guarantee or something that, or like that makes us stand out. Or like 2022, you know, yes. like, like dating, love it. like, it's or up to date. five tips or something. Uh -huh. Yes. Got it. I love so, that. We we put prices into one of the the ecom sites we'd worked with in the titles, and our click through rates in search went through the roof. So it's our click through rates and the user behavior signals from our experience that that Google will look at for the next six months to determine you know where you deserve to rank. And when you hit that one year point and your content's on par, your links are growing every month, and your click through rate is better than the competition, and they're staying on your website and not going back to search. At that one year mark, you see this amazing hockey stick curve mm. and that's where it gets really exciting. And then from then on, it's just like this, but mm. getting through that first year for that page, a lot of business owners just don't have the patience. And so mm. to them, I suggest paid search, use paid search to start out with while you're waiting for that page to mature and while you're continuing to get your team to nurture the, the quality and helpfulness of the content, the off page visibility and your search behavior signals. Got it. All right. So that's a lot of work. I will say this is not, <laughs> for, the faint, not for the faint. I got of heart. yelled at so many times. I got, I got a client that came in. He's like, you're supposed to be one of the best SEO. You rank number one for SEO. You're all this stuff. And it's four months in and, and we have not seen any massive improvements in revenue. I don't think you know what you're doing. And I'm like, I'm like, this is going to take a few more months of us unrooting pages that have been proving to Google that they're better results. So we have to earn our way. Um, we get one year into it, you know, he managed to somehow survive with us after a year. He came in with a big basket of, of goodies and he was like, we went from 10,000 a month from a year ago to 110,000 a month now in mm -hmm. revenue. And I was a total jerk to you. And I'm so sorry. Aww. And I'm like, I know a year is a long time, but yeah. it was worth it and it paid off. And now that business is thriving. So that, I, I think that is such Good advice. All right. So patience, everybody, patience. Steve, if people want to reach out to you, uh, if they have questions, that kind of thing, what is the best way for them to do it? Oh, I'm easy to find. It's just SEO Steve everywhere. SEO Steve on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, we do have an uh, Academy of Search site if you're interested and you want to 
see some of those those uh, templates that we'd mentioned before around um, you know trying to build out a good strategy. Um, you can go to Academy of Search. Uh, use use code SEO Steve to get free access to all my stuff. Um, enjoy, uh, download, ask questions, give me feedback. But uh, yeah, pretty much SEO Steve everywhere. I love it. Well, I have to say, Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for letting me share. I hope you guys like this episode. And for me, my biggest takeaway is SEO is a long game and that you can continue to tweak and optimize and reach out for backlinks. And it is a process. And if you play by Google's rules, you will be rewarded. But there is something very logical and methodical about SEO. And for me, it feels much easier than trying to figure out how to go viral on TikTok. Before I go, I want to say, if you are somebody, a blogger, creator, who has an audience already on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and or has a significant email list and you are not selling digital goods to your audience, I promise you I can help you make significant money. So please get on a call with me. Head to mylotree.com slash meet and we will talk about it. And I will see you all here next week. Week.